Hi everyone, welcome and welcome back to Dr. Han's classroom. I know a lot of you find my channel in the last two months and during this time, the science on COVID vaccine and the status of the pandemic has been changing so rapidly. And there have been weeks that I feel like I haven't been able to provide enough update to you all with just one video topic. So this week I'm combining two topics in this one video. First I'm going to talk about a cliff note version of the CDC recommendation of the booster dose and the reason behind the vote and the implications of that. And second I will talk about the latest Pfizer press released on the vaccine result in children 5 to 11 years old. So this video should have some information information for all of you. And without further ado, let's get started. Let's first look at the flow of the decision process. The Pfizer submitted the third dose or booster dose application for all adults above 18 years old in early September. Last week, the Vaccine and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee voted the third dose to be safe and effective for 65 years old plus people and those with chronic diseases and maybe certain high-risk occupation. And on Wednesday, September 22nd, the FDA agreed with the advisory committee, so they issued the Emergency Use Authorization or EUA for the Pfizer booster dose for the following three categories of people. The first two categories of people are pretty easy to define. First one are the individuals 65 years of age and older. Second are the individuals 18 through 64 years of age at high risk of severe COVID-19. But the third group is a little bit more difficult to define, which are the individuals 18 through 64 years of age whose frequent institutional or occupational exposure to SARS-CoV-2 put them at high risk of serious complication of COVID-19, including severe COVID-19. And so on Thursday, September 23rd, the CDC Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP, met and voted to recommend the Pfizer third dose for the following four groups of people. Number one, 65 years old, 15 voted yes, zero voted no, long-term care resident, everyone voted yes, and 50 to 64 years with underlying condition. 13 out of the 15 voted yes. And number four, 18 to 49 years old with underlying condition are recommended to weigh the individual benefit with risk. Nine voted yes, six voted no. And the committee voted against recommending the booster dose for high risk occupations or setting. Six voted yes, nine voted no. There was quite a debate on the last vote. Committee members that voted yes argue that additional dose for healthcare workers could protect them from long COVID and also reduce absentees from work due to COVID infection, so to maintain the capacity of the healthcare settings. But Arda mentioned that healthcare workers wear PPE and they don't get infected at work. There's also no data supporting how much of the third dose could reduce transmission and the additional dose may not necessarily change the course of the pandemic. I was watching the whole debate of the last vote and for the first time I started to hear more on individual risk and benefit. And if you have left me comments in the past, you would know that this individual risk versus benefit is something I have always been emphasizing in my replies. So the vote outcome mostly was based on not having enough benefit data to support the booster dose for healthy younger people even if they are in high risk occupations. But the booster dose story is like a drama now. The CDC chief overturned the committee's vote on not recommending the booster dose for 18 to 49 years old frontline workers overnight. This is highly unusual, but it makes the recommendation aligned with the FDA EUA indication for the Pfizer booster dose. 
So if you look at the flow of the decision process, we are now in the final stage where this is going to the public. So let's look at the final takeaway points from the booster dose discussions. First one is that the definition of fully vaccinated is still two doses, in particular the two Pfizer dose vaccine. The meeting on September 23rd did not discuss to modify that definition, so there's no need to get the booster dose for federal mandate yet. And second, every recommendation still only applies to the Pfizer mRNA vaccine. Moderna and Johnson and Johnson recipients are not included in these discussions. It is still not recommended to mix COVID vaccine in the U.S. Now I know even though it is being done in many countries, but not recommended in the U.S. Now we are going to the second topic of the week. Let's first have a little quick summary of the background of the Pfizer COVID vaccine in children under the age of 12. The main difference is that the mRNA dose in the vaccine instead of 30 micrograms for children 12 to 17 and adults of all age, the dose in children under 12 is only at 10 micrograms. This dose was determined through the phase 1 study. In the phase 1 study, there were 114 volunteers between 5 and 11 years old, where Pfizer did test the 10, 20, and 30 microgram dose. It was still given in two doses and three weeks apart, just like the dosing schedule in other age groups. The Pfizer found that the smallest 10 microgram dose worked great, so they move on to combine phase 2-3 study for the same group of people. In their phase 2-3 study, 4,500 children aged from 6 months to 11 years old from US, Finland, Poland, and Spain were included in the study. The primary outcome measured are the local and systemic side effects antibody titer level compared to 16 to 25 years old. And in terms of the secondary outcomes, infection prevention rate was only one of those secondary outcomes. So the press release basically said that one month after the second dose, the 10 microgram dose produced a non-inferior neutralizing antibody titer level when compared to the 30 microgram dose in age 16 and 25, and this is the basis for their efficacy claim. But there are a few things we need to pay close attention, and especially for the parents. Number one, the study of this size will never find cases of myocarditis. The study would need to enroll three times the current participants to theoretically observe one event. Then the question is, could Pfizer measure preclinical markers of myocarditis, such as rise in troponin level? The answer is yes, they could, but we don't know if they did it or not, or at least at this point, we have no way to know. The second question has to tie back to the booster dose discussion Pfizer had it with the FDA advisory committee last week. During the meeting, Pfizer admitted that currently they do not know the exact level of antibodies or neutralizing antibodies that can offer protection. Now when this is the case, how could antibody level alone be able to tell the efficacy? In their press release for children vaccine efficacy, they did not report the efficacy number in terms of infection prevention. I wonder, was it because of the sample size being too small to find significant differences, or is there actually a difference? Pfizer did not tell us in the press release this piece of data will have to wait until it is in the FDA office. And the third question is, why did Pfizer test the same two dose 21 days apart in younger children? Now to answer this third question, or to think about it, we have to look at what UK is doing. The UK is now only giving one shot of the Pfizer vaccine 
to their children age from 12 to 15, and is waiting to see more benefit data before suggesting the second shot near the end of this year. And the UK is not even considering giving the mRNA vaccine to children less than 12 years old at this point at the time of this video being recorded. So the question comes to risk and benefits. Previously, I've produced a video looking at a different age group, 12 to 17, the risk of myocarditis versus the risk of severe COVID-19 or hospitalizations. And we concluded that the risk for hospitalization in younger children or healthy children is quite low. And at the same time, the risk for myocarditis is also not very high, although it is still higher than those without the vaccine. So the question comes down to what is the benefit, right? And here are some of the critical questions every parent needs to be aware. First one is that the clinical trial is not designed to measure the rate of prevention as their primary outcome because the trial enrolled children with or without prior evidence of SARS-CoV-2 virus infection. Here I uh, highlighted in yellow. And the primary outcome is only measuring antibody level. This data, while it looks good, it does not answer how this level will help or can help to prevent COVID-19 infection directly. So what is the real benefit of vaccinating children younger than 12 years old at this point? Now, So far, the public has no way to know, and I don't want to give my opinion here. But the truth is, unlike we could report a percentage efficacy rate in older adolescents and in adults, okay, some percentage, like 80 some percentage or something, we just don't know about that number for kids less than 12 years old at this point. And I hope by the time FDA discussing their data, I hope the public can know that number to get an idea of how well this vaccine can protect our younger children from getting COVID. So the real benefit is again on individual cases based on the underlying disease and overall health status. And just a few days ago, Mark, one of my viewer, left a comment mentioning he was very baffled about the benefit of vaccinating his 15-year-old daughter. And his question is definitely valid. And honestly, the individual benefit is quite vary in some cases and uh, for healthy individuals the benefit may be marginal at this point and but on the society level some level of protections can possibly reduce the disruptions in learning for example less or no quarantine after exposures and study have shown that students generally do better with in-school learning. So having vaccine maybe on that level could be beneficial. But I know some people may argue with me that the rate of child cases has jumped by 240% in the US since July. Now, I want to look at this question or this statement a little bit closely. We need to ask, what about the severity of these increased cases? So now let's look at this report from CDC, which look at emergency department visit and hospital admissions among children and adolescents aged 0 to 17 in the month of August to August, from last year August to this year August. So let's look at this very nice infographic from CDC. And basically, it says children and adolescents' COVID-19 hospitalization rate are higher in states with low overall vaccination rate, and the difference is up to four times. This data suggests an increase in hospitalization and severe cases in children are associated with increase in adult cases and the overall adult vaccination status. And here is another question for you to think about. If enough adults are vaccinated or acquired immunity from infection recovery, then how will that affect the infection rate and severity in children? Right? 
And the takeaway point from this portion of the video is that first, COVID vaccine can be beneficial in children with risk factors, but the benefits cannot be generalized to all children at this point because there's just not enough data or evidence to support it. And remember, children are a vulnerable group of people and the benefits needs to be significantly greater than the risk before considering the vaccine for younger children. And the final consideration is always surrounding the mandate, right? Should COVID vaccine in young children be a voluntary action or a mandate? The science at this point appears to support it being a choice. Another fact is that almost all myocarditis cases happen after the second dose. So if Pfizer can show us the antibody level after one dose, if it is high enough, then why risk having myocarditis to give the second dose? Why can the US FDA not think like the UK agency to look at the possibility of giving only one dose first and delay the second dose? Now, when UK delayed the second dose for their adults, the protection appeared to last longer. So, will FDA experts consider that possibility for our children? And if you are still sticking with the video, watch all the way through from the beginning to here, you would see there are many questions that I've been asking. Maybe you have the same questions. And indeed, this Pfizer press release for efficacy in children aged from 5 to 11 did not answer a lot of questions. And in fact, they raised more unanswered questions. And I really hope when they start meeting with the FDA advisory committee in the next month, perhaps sometime in October, they would be able to provide answer to some of those concerns that a lot of us have. So I know this is a very long video. If you are still watching at this point, I thank you very much for sticking with it. Now, like I said at the beginning, science on COVID vaccine has been changing so rapidly these days, and I will continue to do my best to stick with the news and provide an update to you all as soon as I possible. Now, if you would like to continue to follow these updates with me, please consider subscribing to the channel and hit the like button and share this video. This channel needs your help to reach more people. And lastly, that's all for this week. I'll thank you again for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Meanwhile, please stay safe and healthy. Bye.